Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So we are starting our first Dr. Kelly and Virtual Doctors Night Out special. And joining me is Dr. Kelly Ann, who I'll turn it over to. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Kelly Ann Petrucci. I'm your host of today's special episode on Doctors Night Out. Today is special because we all know, the panelists and myself, of course you can see we have a star-studded panelist, we know that this is a, a very unusual, <laughs> very unusual holiday. And our hope and our intention with the show today is to bring you some ease and help you see some, all the things that we've learned over the years that have really helped us look at things maybe a little bit differently. And maybe in looking at it this way, we'll bring you some inner peace in any doctor or any expert that you see on Doctor's Night Out or Doctor Night Nights Out special. These are doctors that I know, love, and trust. These are experts that have integrity. They are committed to growth. They have authenticity that is just warming to the spirit. They are your true truth seekers. Welcome panel. So happy to have you. And here we are on a holiday and these people are bringing it home. I can't thank them enough. They are star studded. As I said, let's start here with Emily Fletcher. Say hi, Emily. Hi friends. Emily Hello. Fletcher. She's amazing. She's the creator of Ziva Technique. So she is the meditation guru in New York City. I have personally studied her program, and I can tell you she is absolutely transformative, and everything that you see is what you get on the street. She is true to who she is and what she does. She is, again, the creator of the Ziva Technique and the founder of Ziva, where she developed the World Meditation Training Program. She has inspired to teach so many people experiencing the profound physical and mental benefits that meditation can provide during her 10-year career on Broadway. Yes, I said Broadway. Dr. <laughs> Rosenberg. Say hi, Dr. Rosenberg. Hello. Welcome. This is Dr. Joan Rosenberg, best-selling author, consultant, and master clinician, which she indeed is. Dr. Joan Rosenberg is the cutting-edge psychologist who is known as an innovative thinker, acclaimed speaker and trainer, a two-time TEDx speaker and member of the Association of Transformative Leaders. And she has been recognized for her thought leadership and influence and personal development. She's also, she does her psychology in California. She's done so much. She teaches about resilience and she certainly has helped me. She's a graduate psychology a professor at Pepperdine University. Her latest book, 90 Seconds to a Life You Love, is amazing. I've read it. I live by it. So happy you're here. Dr. Vincent Pedre. Say hi, Dr. Pedre. Hi, Karibu, which means welcome in uh, Swahili. Ah, so he even knows Swahili. So I have to tell you, every time I have Dr. Pedre on, he is a regular on Doctor's Night Out because the audience just loves him and here's why. He is the guy who sends me research all day long. I discovered this, I found this, I did this. In addition to being out there, seeing patients, he is absolutely remarkable. We're so appreciative to have his wealth of knowledge on the show. He's a functional medicine certified doctor who's an out of the box thinker, founder of successful private practice in New York City since 2004, where he's helped literally thousands of patients over the years. He's my go-to gut expert. He's He's got a best-selling book, Happy Gut, can't forget that, and he's basically a bridge. He's able to eloquently meld together different perspectives, integrating holistic approaches with Western medicine. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. So tonight we're going to talk about, or this afternoon, we're going to talk about the mind, body, spirit. We've talked a lot about heavy topics on this show, helping people get through all of the struggles that they have in life and through this whole COVID-19 scenario. But here we are, we're at a holiday, and it brings even new perspectives on what we're dealing with every day, where this Easter feels a little different than it ever has before. And Dr. Pedro, I'd like to start with you. Let's bounce some things off of you. We all have this need right now to heal. We all feel this connection very differently than I think than ever before. So I have texts coming in all day, as I know all the experts are right now. And I have phone calls, everything. People telling me how they're feeling, what they're going through. But the one thing that I've really noticed 
is that people now more than ever want to feel a connection with themselves. So we have been feeling, you know, connecting with others all through life. We naturally connect to all of these things. But what I've noticed is that a lot of us become numb and we go from thing to thing to thing. We go from, from experience to experience to experience, but now we're left in a situation where the stopwatch is on. We are stuck Still. All of that has been taken away. You know, all, all of the away. all of the shiny objects that distract you, they've been taken away. And what remains is you looking at yourself. And I think we're gonna we're gonna see a, almost like a, a bit of an existential crisis. I think coming out of this for a lot of people. So, what do you mean when you say existential existential crisis? What do you? I, I mean, it's like a reevaluation of of life like looking at themselves at, at multiple levels. And what I wanted to share is an insight that I've had over 20 years of taking care of people and, and asking myself the question, you know, what is, what is true healing? You know, is it, is it just healing the body? Is that, is that healing? And anybody who's a doctor knows that if you're fooling yourself to thinking that you're just healing the body, then that's a delusion. When you're a healthcare practitioner, you're dealing with mind, body, and spirit. But then how, why is it that so many doctors that they see patients, they come in and it's, it's five minutes. So are you saying the five minute visit, they can't truly heal? I don't think you're getting to the depth of the places that you need to go with people in order to really peel the layers of the onion to find that juicy middle, the thing that maybe they're not saying at the very beginning of the visit, but they tell you at 29 minutes in, the most important thing, and I can't tell you how many times that has happened to me, Kellyanne, where I am almost ready to conclude the visit and then they tell me the most important thing that they were not sharing. Which is? Uh, you know what, it could be like sharing that their eating comes from a bad relationship they had where they were told that they were ugly and that the way that they compensated for that was just to eat themselves too heavy so that no one would ever like them or think that they're attractive. You know, things like that or a patient who came in and came in because of gut issues and was telling me all these things that had happened in his life and then he just suddenly slipped in there, like, um, and this was a 31 year old guy. I lost my wife at 28 to breast cancer. And then he just kept talking. And I was, you know, and I'm like, you know, part of what I do is I'm very <laughs> astute listener. And I think anybody who's a health practitioner uh, that really cares about their patients, you're listening for the details. Because in that moment, I went, rewind, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that loss you had at 28 when you lost your wife. And he cried with me. This is a guy who had to keep it together for his wife, for his family. He cried there in my office and then told me, this is the first time I've cried about this. Mm, well, see, that's you know. why I kind of, and, 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 it's, and that's really, uh, feels, I feel a lot of depth with that. And that's why I made you answer that last question, because what I want people to understand is if you're not getting that in your physician, you really have to seek all corners of everything on your own. I love functional medicine doctors, which is what you are, because they really dip into that and they pay attention to that because at, at the end of the day, it's paradigm. It we're looking at the body as we're looking at the body as a as a system, and last year um, I had this aha moment as you and I talk in the background, like we're just com constantly uh, coming up with ideas, and I just have this vision, and I called it the pyramid of healing, mm -hmm. and I want to show. Can I show that to you? Can you show the board. Show yeah, I want to take you to my board. Uh, we've done this before, so I'm gonna flip my camera. And so this is what I call the pyramid of healing. And imagine a pyramid that has three levels. And you see the, the bottom level is the biggest one. That's us here, this, the physical body. We're here to be physical beings. The second level is the mental emotional body. And then the third level is the spiritual body. 
Now, notice the physical body is the foundation. You know, so it's like your temple. You have to take care of your physical body. But if you're just taking care of your mental, emotional, but not taking care of your physical body, the foundation of the temple of healing is weak and it's going to collapse. Or if you do what some people do, which we call spiritual bypass, where they bypass taking care of their, their physical body and they go all into spirituality and whatnot, but they're not taking care of the lower, lower levels, eventually the whole thing is going to collapse. So in my vision of what true healing is for an individual, it's healing that happens at the physical level, at the mental, emotional level, and at the spiritual level. So it's almost okay. like the, it's all, it's almost like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs where you, it's very difficult to get past one without the other. And yet some people do what we call spiritual bypass where they focus on one. And what my vision was is that you have to have all levels. If you want to achieve true healing and self actualization. And we talked about this. Uh, I've, I've been reading a book by Thomas More, an old book called The Care of the Soul. And it was written back in the 20th century. And he talked about how in the 20th century, people were feeling like a, a vacuity inside, you know, that sometimes leads to mental uh, anguish, like depression, anxiety. And what he was saying is that people were lacking meaning, like they're looking for that spirituality. And spirituality is a commonality between all religions. You know, so that is the one thing you can say. There's spirituality in Judaism, there's spirituality in Catholicism, in Hinduism, Buddhism. They all have that underlying tone of spirituality because I think the human condition is to really, to actualize itself, you need to find meaning and purpose. And that's part of the whole healing cycle that I see that, that people, a lot of people are missing. And I think what Thomas More said back in the 1900s, late 1900s, is just as relevant today as the world goes into this crisis that's, I think, going to give birth to a new search for meaning and purpose in life. So what are you telling your patients now that you're, you're hearing all new things and there's new worries and new concerns. How are you guiding them t t towards that light? And what can you tell people that are watching or listening? What can you do to help them pull themselves out of the tunnel? I mean, first, take care of your physical body. Your body is your temple. So if you're not eating right, you're not getting enough rest, you're not hydrating well enough, then your physical body is going to suffer. And then you have to go into the mental, emotional body. And I almost think of this as the steps of healing, you know, because, you know, say your physical body is okay, but now you're at home and you're starting to feel the challenges with your loved ones. So maybe you're starting to see that there are weaknesses and holes in your mental, emotional body that you haven't addressed because you were so distracted with life. And I know that's where Joan comes in. And then once you get there and you're healing your mental and em emotional body, and that might evolve a lot of things. And I will tell you the, the, the one word that is the key there starts with an L. Love, could it be? Love, love, love. I mean, self-love. And um, really also there's another word that I think is really important for healing at that level is forgiveness. And the biggest the biggest level of forgiveness that a lot of people don't realize they need to make is to forgive themselves. That is beautiful. And I hope everyone really heard that, you know, forgiving themselves and allowing yourself to feel gratitude. Because again, you know, we keep saying this in, in the program, there's, there's something to your cells. They communicate, they have a megahertz, they radiate, they talk. They, they, they share messages and signals with other areas of the body. So if I were to say to someone that's listening, that feels that right now, that feels in crisis in their body, in their mind, spirit, that if they can somehow feel that, somehow feel gratitude, what you were saying earlier, Dr. Pedre, somehow feel this purpose. I think those are the and two that, things that are going to- And that's, that's the other level, which, you know, greats in history talked about this. Albert Einstein talked about it about that the, the greatest force, actually a friend of mine posted this on Instagram 
And it was originally, I, I, I saw it and I didn't know if it was real, that said that Einstein wrote a letter to his daughter and he said that after so many years, he's actually discovered what the greatest force in the universe is. And he said, it's love. And, but the other thing that Einstein talked about is, is connecting with a higher purpose, something that's bigger than you, you know? And I think that's where Emily comes in is that, that spiritual aspect that you can access through meditation to connect you to something bigger, more broader, um, more expansive than you are. So then you can be more expansive and broader and um, imaginative and bring all of that healing into your life and be the true light that everyone is meant to be in this world. And you may not even know it's there yet, but it is. It is there, something powerful, something expansive, something so beautiful that you actually can tap into. And I hope everyone stays tuned because Emily is going to walk us through a beautiful meditation that will help you start, start dipping into some of this beauty. Dr. Rosenberg, I wanna, I wanna hit it to you. Dr. Rosenberg, a lot of people have been telling me what they're feeling and I've noticed this last week, it seemed to really kind of eclipse in a way I've noticed people feeling more deeply than they have a lot of different emotions. There's people, you know, with, with even something we don't think about. What if people with that have issues, people that have OCD, that they no longer can be have any prediction to their life or or their the outcome in, in the future, <laughs> which we really don't have anyway. But nevertheless, these people that are feeling all of these different emotions, people that are in relationships that have really taken a turn one way or the other. What, how are you guiding people to manage the relationships and the life that is, is very different right now? Well, you know, it's, it's a, the part of what I want people to understand, <clears throat> Kellyanne, is, is that this is a time of profound loss, unfortunately. So I just, I just need to pro pro provide the context for people. It's, and, and again, I, I don't want to get lost in, in naming them, but, but you've touched on a couple in terms of kind of this loss of predictability or loss of a sense of security. So, so what am I hearing? I'm probably hearing many things, all of you are, is things like strained relationships or somebody that is feeling overwhelmed and frayed nerves. Or uh, I'm just reading a post where somebody was feeling quite lonely and quite sad. And again, we can probably go on with many of those kinds of things as well. Uh, but, the, it, it, but part of it is understanding that when this first happened, um, some people probably moved into a little bit of a state of shock. Uh, so it was the, the feeling the overwhelm, feeling the um, maybe frozen and numb a little bit. Um, some people might have experienced it as rage, others might have experienced it as confusion. And I think because there was so much activity that had to take place, getting kids settled, getting a routine established, all those different kinds of things, um, uh, uh, probably a lot of the focus in those early weeks was one, just trying to make sense of what was happening and, and, and going, am I going to be able to have food? Or for many, was it, I'm going to be able to have toilet paper or paper towels or whatever, right? People got panicked over, over basic life necessities. Once we had the sense that, that okay, our food, our food supply was going to stay intact, I think that that calmed a lot of people down. Um, I want to give again, a, I, I have a, I have a real life story, Joan, where I want to kind of give a shout out to your work oh, uh, because please. this past week I had a patient with severe anxiety. He was calling my office manager several times during the day and finally reached out to him. He was, he was just feeling really anxious. He's like, I can't, I'm nervous. I'm not going to be able to provide for my family. Um, what if I die? all these things. And I told him, actually, you're not feeling anxiety. What you're feeling is one of the eight uncomfortable emotions. And I think the one that's coming up for you right now is vulnerability. You're feeling your vulnerability, but you're not letting yourself really feel that emotion. So you're staying up here in the idea of anxiety. So I said, you know, put your hands, one on your chest, one on your belly, breathe into your body. Right. And, and let me ask you this. Are you in danger right now? No. And I said, well, then you, can we say something? Can we say I am okay? So I followed your method and it's amazing how he got it immediately. Thank so you. kudos. I just wanted to give that shout out because I had this experience <laughs> this week with a patient 
and I've been hearing you speak. I've read your book, and um, it's just amazing to see how it applies practically. So again, sorry to interrupt, but no, I just no, had no, to like a, I had to jump wonderful. in there and say that. <laughs> what an honoring interruption! I love it. Thank you. No, it's and and that's very true. It's that it, part of the challenge, Kellyanne, is that so many people have. Uh, we've, we, most of us go through life thinking that uh, this sense of stability or the sense of security that we have is the thing. It's the constant. The challenge is, is that change is the constant. But most, pe most people neither live with the, the idea of change as the constant, and, and to uh, Vincent's point, nor do they live with the idea that we're vulnerable basically all of the time. And that we, we have to kind of keep that idea in our back pocket in order, in order to be able to live fully. So it's like, I, I want people to, to be able to make a shift here and, and understand that change is the constant. Even change yeah. like this. Even, even, change even, right. Who could have predicted this? Who predicts earthquakes? Who predicts tornadoes? Who predicts floods? Who predict, right? Who, who predicts these, these kinds of events? Uh, you know, there have been concerns more broadly from, from scientists about a pandemic, but so the, 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 that was out there, but, it, but the, it's like if, if people can adopt, and I, I talk about this as kind of resilience thinking or resilience attitudes, so that if people can adopt certain kinds of ways of thinking, it can make a huge difference in their ability to make it through this time. And, and so part of the challenge is, as this is continuing, and kind of to Vincent's point, as this process is, gets, gets extended, we have, we're more still. We're not panicked over the first things we were panicked about. We have a schedule. We're sort of figuring out the kids. We're sort of figuring out the husband or the wife, right? So, so that's getting a little bit more in order. Yet what has to come up because we're more quiet is all the stuff that didn't get dealt with. And I've, I've actually, I've heard from people here in New York, you know, cause now we're in week three of quarantine and it's in, it's starting to hit people hard. I right. Know. This week past, three. right. So, and, and out, I'm in week five. This so to so Dr. Rosenberg, you said yes. that really this whole behavior analysis of, of, um, understanding this resilience is a matter of a, a way of thinking. Can you give I, I would say it's a, it's a variety of things. So based on my work, the foundational piece of being resilient is to be able to experience and move through the feelings you're feeling, right? So, so it, and I talk about eight unpleasant ones. So I, and I, I don't want to belabor this point, but there's sadness, shame, helplessness, anger, vulnerability, embarrassment, disappointment and frustration. So that we can expect that we're gonna move through and have moments or periods of those feelings. Move through them, just let yourself experience them and let them kind of flow through. And if you can, stay present at that point to, to what those feelings are connected to. What triggered you? And, and so stop, stop and think about that and, and see if you can then take it one step further. Is it related to just now? Or is it also related to the past? Because the past is going to allow you to kind of surface the, the core things that are really going on. And then stop and think even further. Are there any insights that are coming from this? What can I, what can I learn from what I'm experiencing this moment? And, and if you've got a journal, you know, keep, a journal is a great thing to keep during this time. It really is. You know? And, and again, what I breathe through the experience, and, and I, I, I trust that Emily is going to actually lead us into some of that. So, so the, I want you to breathe when the feelings come, let them flow, do some of the things I'm suggesting by asking some of those questions, notice the insights, and then notice whether, the, whether you need to make a decision based on what you're experiencing, whether you need to express something based on what you're experiencing, or if there's a certain kind of action to take based on what you're experiencing. So that's, so that's the foundational pieces, the eight unpleasant feelings, and then these kind of questions and things you can do based on the feelings. That's number one. Second, in terms of resilience, is ask for help. So stay well connected. We're social beings. We were not intended to just give, and we were not intended to just take. 
So, so if you need something and you're, you tend to be the giver, like let that go and allow yourself to ask for help when you're, when you, when the need is there or when the, uh, the, the, you're hitting certain limitations. You know, I've, uh, my mother, uh, quite gratefully is still alive and the challenge she's, she's a month shy of 98. God bless her. And, and, wow. and she lives alone. And, and to get her to ask for help and to allow my cousins or somebody to go get her food is a, it remains a something I'm still trying to teach her at her age, right? You know so, what? God bless her. God right. bless her. Because there's a certain level of stubbornness that gets you to 98 years old. Exactly. Exactly. So, so but asking for help is crucial. So that's a, that's a resilience skill. I hope everyone's right. hearing that, that it's okay to ask for help. It doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean that you're less than. It doesn't mean that you're needy. It means that we all experience these sometimes unpleasant feelings and you can work through them and move through them in your body. And one of the strategies is to ask for help. Yes. And absolutely. what a gift. It, yes. You give people a gift. If you ask for help, That's they exactly get to true. have the it's gift of feeling like they're helping you and, and helping you. Yeah, absolutely. So the way I think about asking for help, two things. One is that, it, to your point, Emily, it's a compliment. It's not a burden. It's rarely a burden. Um, so, so yes, I totally see it as a compliment because it values and respects the other. And, and then the, the other part of it is that I think of asking for help as a critical piece of emotional strength. So it, it, it is. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of our humanness. When a, a person who's been a guru in my life um, told me this a long time ago, and I always live by this phrase, vulnerability is perfect protection. So everybody thinks that right. vulnerability makes you weak, but vulnerability actually protects you because you've laid it all out on the table. That's right. And the truth is that everybody has an element of vulnerability in them, so they can relate to that. Right, right. So then, so then there's, and then there's a number of different things that, that one can do in terms of kind of the, this resilience idea. So not only do I want people asking for help, I want people to, with sadness and loneliness or with the experience of helplessness, com and being in community makes a big difference. So reach out to people, text them, call them, be on technology if you, in terms of the internet or whatever, Zoom or whatever it may be. But stay, stay well connected to people, stay in community crucial it pushes back against helplessness and it also pushes back against the loneliness and the or, sadness or send somebody in your life that you love that you haven't spoken to in a while a text message telling them how much you appreciate them just think if you receive that i know i've received it once oh, in a while beautiful. and i send it out to my friends it's right. like how good it feels to get that right right totally totally and then, and then I would say adopt uh, other resilience attitudes. If you've been through difficult times before then, and you've persevered, you can adopt the, the mentality of I'm going to persevere. Or I've been through difficult times before. What strengths did I have then that I can draw on now? Uh, the, so the, the, uh, another is to be, understand that change is the constant. So I, I, you know, many, many years ago, I had an experience probably when I was, uh, actually it started when I was a sophomore in, in my undergraduate studies in, in college. Um, I had an experience where, where at, at that point, it was, the, it was the words about teaching me about vulnerability and about this, um, everything can change, kind of this notion that security is an illusion. And then I went through an experience a couple of years later in my life where I, I lost work, I lost a relationship, and I lost my home. So, so it's like, I, so knowing that like there was an awareness at that point, not only about the vulnerability that we all experience, not only that changes the constant, but that security is sort of an illusion. So we, we, do we want to build a sense of predictability? Yes, with the attitude that we know that things can change in an instant. So we want to... So we want to hold, we want to be able to hold this idea of that change can occur, change is the constant, that we'd be flexible and adaptive in the face of change. So drawing on those strengths, drawing on 
an attitude, again, another resilience attitude of um, every life experience I go through is a learning experience. What can I learn from this? Or uh, another uh, resilience thought is, um, uh, how can I use this experience to bring the best out of me? Or who do Amen. I want to be? Who do I want to be? Right? I, so I, think, that, I think that's important. And I want everyone to really hear that last part, because if everyone can just take a moment now, you know, whoever is watching and listening and just say, who do I want to be when this is over? Because this will be over. And this will go down in the history books and that people will be analyzing it and they'll gather data and they'll talk about it. And, but all that aside, who do you want to be? And, you know, I, that, this whole doctor's night out was born of that notion and of that attitude of looking at this and saying, who do I want to be when this is over? I want to be someone who shifted the consciousness, took people away from fear, brought them into a sense of empowerment. That's who I want to be. I want to be a leader. So you have to make decisions based on that. And Dr. Rosenberg, I appreciate that. And that, that to me, so many profound statements, but really recognize that you might be going through these negative emotions and that you can work through them and please ask for help. Please stay in community. Please understand that you're going to persevere this and that there are strategies and there are tactics that you can use to have to build this resilience and always keep in front of mind the things that have brought you success before. Tap into that feeling, that emotion, allow it to come into your body and move you through. I wanna to talk to you, Emily. Emily, you're a New Yorker. And so you mm -hmm. are around, you know, kind of the Mecca, as is Dr. Pedre and myself, uh, the Mecca of, of everything kind of happening. I love New York. I mean, you can't say it better than that. <laughs> So tell me, you are in the business of defunking people. You're in the business of defunking <laughs> people, taking the fuzz out of them, letting them feel the spirit, that white light flow through them in a time now of darkness. So tell me what you're telling people. How are you helping people? I know you do these global meditations. Kudos to you. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you. And so tell me, what, wh how are you approaching this with your people? Well, it's so in line with what Vincent and Joan have already been saying. And, and to me, the meditation piece is just giving you the visceral experience of all these beautiful concepts that they've just laid out intellectually. With the meditation, you're moving beyond the physical body. I would even offer that you're moving through the emotional body and then getting into the spiritual body. And when you do that, when you start to connect to that piece of us... Pyramid. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm referencing the pyramid there. When you start to connect that spiritual piece of us that lives beyond the death of this body, then this idea that control is an illusion, that the only constant is change, becomes a little less terrifying. Because right. if we're only identified with this meat suit, if we think that when this bag of skin dies, I die, and we've never been able to access anything bigger than that, anything broader than that, then something that threatens this meat suit is that's it. It's fight or flight. It's life or death. Nothing else matters. I have to control even more. And if that's the only mindset that you're in, then this whole global pandemic can be re-traumatizing. And, and I think that right now we're being faced with a choice. Do we allow this global pandemic where we are waking up to the fact that control was always an illusion, that we were never in control? Do we allow that to re-traumatize us because usually childhood trauma comes from us being out of control, realizing that we're out of control. And so when we globally have this experience, it can kick up some real dust. So I feel like we as humans have an opportunity to go down one of two paths. One would be to let this trauma add to our armor, to add to our calluses, that's something we need to protect ourselves from. Or we could use this as an opportunity for this sort of global trauma, if you will, to highlight the places where we have yet to heal and use this as an opportunity to become more resilient, to really feel the things that, as you guys both said, we've been distracting ourselves from. We're being forced. We can't go out, so we might as well go in. And I mean, capital yeah. I, go in. And I think that you know this could end up being something that creates more stress, more trauma, more panic, or... And this is the, the camp that I'm really fighting for, and I know that all of you are as well, or this is an opportunity for a mass global awakening like we've never seen before, when people here, are here. forced to sit with themselves. And so like, why not choose that? Why not choose it? It's available to us. We have technology now. We can teach meditation. We can get amazing, brilliant therapists and doctors like y'all out into the masses for free on, you know, on social media. So why not? 
Well, I really feel for the first time in, in, lately, even though I'm hearing so many things out there that from the doctors that are coming on the program, this truly is a mission for many, many, many that really do want to help and do want to make these shifts. These doctors are wanting to come on this show without just, I want to make a difference. I want to make a difference. I want to make that shift. So that this whole notion of a global awakening, oh, it's happening. Whether we even realize it or not, I feel the shift and I can see the shift. Yeah. I mean, my job a month ago used to be convincing everyone why they needed to meditate and talking about the science behind why it's going to help you have better sex and make more money. And my joke was that I take this powerful medicine of meditation and I wrap it in the candy coating of like sex and money. People don't care about the candy coating anymore. They're just like, give me all the meditation. <laughs> like my, you know, people are coming to me in droves right now. And, right. and I'm so grateful that I don't have to pitch meditation to people that they're now seeing that self-care is not non-negotiable. I mean, and, I, I think and that all of us, is exciting. Yes. I think all of us that are in this to really shift this, we're busier than ever. All of us, all of us have to make sure that we keep meditating <laughs> because yeah, we're so true. busy, you know, really going out there and trying to make a difference with our purpose. So uh, what about financial stress? And Emily, this is what, this is where people are starting to, the sweat box is happening. What would you tell people in terms of how, how your mind and how this sense of spirituality, this kicking into meditation can help bring ease to something that may seem pretty dire to many. Well, there's, I think this is um, a woman named Pacchietti. I can't remember her first name right now, but she said, while we're all weathering the same storm, some people are in a yacht and some people are in a canoe with one oar. <laughs> and so I don't want to pretend to be able to speak to what it feels like to really truly not know where I'm going to get my next meal. And I don't want to pretend to speak to that level of survival because the sad reality is that millions and millions of people are in that boat. And when you're actually in a survival mode, when you're actually, I mean, I imagine that fight or flight of not knowing where your next meal comes from, like you kind of need to be a little stressed in order to get through that. And so, but I will say that for a lot of us who are not in that boat, we, we might be a little scared. We might not know about next month's mortgage, but right now we have food in the pantry. Right now we know we're going to have dinner tonight, which is where I think, you know, the majority of folks are, you know, we're going to have millions in the bank, but we're, we know we're okay for a couple of weeks, maybe even a couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, and then the stress becomes all speculation. Right. It's like, when is this going to end? When am I going to be able to make a paycheck again? How, what if about this? What about my rent? And it just, it comes, we come back to this idea that speculation leads always and only to suffering. Can I, I want to add something there, Emily, just for a moment. And the, the, just to your point, just this whole notion that if people know that they have the few weeks or the few months available to them, how, uh, what I want people to do is to shift again, shift their mindset. You can, work with some part of this to go, I'm resourced. I, ha I have, re I'm resourced now. I have shelter, I have food, I have family, I have friends, and I have a little bit of finances to work with. Um, then I'm resourced and, and I can be resourceful. So that mm -hmm. to, the, to the anticipation part, to the speculation part, it's helping people then shift part of that to I can be resourceful. Go ahead, please, please. Yeah. yeah, I love that. And, and it's a great antidote because it's like, okay, well, if you don't want me to speculate, like, how do I not speculate? And, and to your point, it's like now, right now, I know I have food to eat. I know I have a place to sleep. Right now, I'm safe. You know, just like Vincent was saying, right now, I'm safe. That is the antidote to speculation. And what I found is that meditation really is the superpower for resilience, for being adaptive, for tapping into your resilience, for processing these emotions so that they don't get stuck on the physical plane. Because I, I have my own sort of a different pyramid. It's similar, but different in that I think we have an opportunity to learn our lessons on the spiritual plane. And if we don't, then they show up on the psychological plane and they are a little slower to heal, take a little longer. And if we don't heal them there, well, then they show up in our physical body. And so while people might say, well, I don't have time to meditate. It's like, well, guess what? If you keep shoving these emotions down, eventually they're going to show up on the physical plane and they're a lot more expensive and take a lot more time to heal once they show up there. They sure do. I found that, that out the hard way. So heed the woman's warning. Believe it was, I, so, so it's a religious time. I imagine those two triangles being together. It's a Jewish star. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> hey, it all works. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's actually Love the same it. triangle. Yeah, just flipped upside down. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, and I, could, and I and by the way, Emily, I, I agree with you on that. <laughs> so, <laughs> great. I'm, we're all, yeah, we're all saying you. the same thing, you guys. We are. We're all saying we are the same totally. thing. One last thing, Emily, before we go into a meditation, for someone who's never meditated before, and now they're looking at this time at home and, and so forth to, to start in, where do they start? And is it something that you can go into right away and feel those uh, benefits? So I'm going to guide you, I'm going to guide us all through an experience today. And my intention is that there is healing that happens right now today in the few minutes that we're in this, that we have a bit of an emotional purge, that we do reconnect to our breath, that we do connect to spirit. And my goal is that that happens now, even in these few minutes. And um, I am a meditation snob, but I think that it's important that people understand that meditation is a skill. Because it's simple, a lot of people think that they should magically already know how to do it. And then because the only real like through line about meditation that's happening out there is that we all believe we should be able to clear our minds. So people sit down and they're like, okay, brain, shut up. Sure would like a snack. No, I have to save my snacks. They're quarantine snacks. Oh no, now I'm thinking about snacks. I suck at meditation and I quit. And that's the beginning and the end of most people's <laughs> meditation career. <laughs> and so it's just reminding ourselves that thoughts are not the enemy of meditation. It is the nature of the mind to think. Actually in the style of meditation that I teach at Ziva, the thoughts are an indicator that stress is leaving the body. So we actually want to celebrate them. And so it's knowing that it's a skill and that means take the time to learn it. You know, you know, if rather than taking up knitting, which is nice and relaxing, might you invest that time in meditation while we have perhaps a bit of extra time? Um, so it's a skill. So obviously learn, learn it. This is your brain that we're talking about. It's responsible for printing every single cell in your body. So when people say, I don't have time, it's like, what else are you doing? Really? <laughs> this is your brain. And then the other piece is just knowing that thoughts are not the enemy. And that goes for today as well. Your mind is going to think some of the thoughts you'll like, some of them you won't like. I don't even care if you enjoy this experience. I care how you feel and perform in the rest of your day. Mm. Beautiful. Okay. So please okay. guide us through a meditation. <clears throat> All right, so uh, you don't have to have any fancy fingers or erect spine, just comfort is key. I would recommend sitting, ideally with your back supported, but your head free, uh, but anywhere you have is fine. We're gonna start with something called the 2X breath, ridiculously simple, but also very powerful. And it's called 2X because we're simply doubling the length of the exhale from the inhale. And this helps to soften the vagus nerve, which is the superhighway between our brains and bodies. Um, so we'll do the 2X breath into um, including everything that's happening around us. We're going to check in with our emotions and we'll end with um, coming back to the love piece, which Vincent inspired me to do this, where we're just going to blast the whole planet and ourselves with some much needed love. Um, all right, so let's begin. So just take a big, delicious inhale through your nose. Exhale through your mouth. Good. So we're inhaling through the nose for the count of two. And we're exhaling through the mouth for the count of four. Really good, in for two and out for four. You can close your eyes if you haven't already. Inhaling through the nose for two, breathing into the belly. And as you exhale, starting to feel your brow soften, your jaw soften, your shoulders drop. Really good, and on this next inhale, through the nose, breathing into your belly, breathing space around your heart. And as you exhale, feeling your shoulders drop, your belly soften, your legs relax, and feeling your feet on the ground. We'll do a few more breaths like this, inhaling through the nose, breathing space around the heart, doubling the length of the exhale, exhaling through the mouth and feeling all of the muscles in your body soften and expand. Anywhere that you might be holding a little extra tension, a little extra speculation, just letting that soften with this exhale. And one final time, letting this be the biggest inhale you've taken all year. And as you exhale, imagine every single muscle from the top of your head, through your neck, your chest, your arms, your belly, your hips, your calves, and your feet. Just letting all of these muscles soften. Really good. And now from this space, we can allow our breath to be easy and natural. We don't have to focus on it or concentrate or manipulate it. Just let it be easy. And now I invite you to listen 
for all the sounds you can detect right now. Listening for the prevalence of my voice. Perhaps you can hear birds chirping outside for the first time in a long time, or maybe there's traffic or the clicking from the computer. And this is a beautiful opportunity to not judge these sounds as good or bad. We're simply pulling the lens of our awareness out and we're including everything that's happening inside of this experience. Full acceptance, full surrender. Really good. And now ever so gently bringing your awareness to your sense of touch. So scanning the body and asking what's the most prevalent tactile sensation happening in my body right now. For most of us, it will likely be the weight of our bodies in the chair. But even if there's a painful sensation happening in the body, can we try to not move away from that pain and instead listen? Instead lean in, instead experience this unpleasant sensation as Joan would have us do. So we're just noticing the physical body right now. What's the most prevalent tactile sensation? If your heart is racing, let it race. And now noticing the most subtle. Can you feel your clothes against your skin? Can you feel the breath as it enters and exits your nostrils? Really good. Now we're gonna take this even deeper to the different layer of the pyramid. We're gonna check in with our emotional and psychological body. So if you like, you can place one hand on your heart, one hand on your belly. Or if you're comfortable, you can leave your hands down, but we're gonna check in with ourselves. We're gonna give ourselves a moment to really feel whatever's coming up for us, whatever's going on in this moment with no brave faces, no proving, no trying to be strong for anyone else. Just a moment of asking, how am I feeling? Really, truly, no BS, how am I feeling right now in this moment in my body, in my heart? How's my heart? How are you? And there's no right or wrong way to do this. If you're fine, you're allowed to be fine. If you're sad, please give yourself permission to be sad. If you're angry, it's okay to be mad. If you're scared, you're allowed to be scared. Emotion is simply energy in motion. So we wanna allow these emotions to move Stagnant water breeds disease. So we're allowing these things to bubble up and out using your hands as receptors to check in and truly feel where you are. Really good. Now you can drop your hands into your lap. Breathe in the word let. And breathe out the word go. Again, breathing in the word let. And breathing out the word go. Reminding yourself that control is an illusion, albeit an attractive one. And from this space of groundedness, of connection with your body, I invite you to think of three things that you're grateful for. It doesn't matter how big or how small they are, just something that brings a little smile to your face. Sunshine, flowers blooming, laughter. And just say, thank you, thank you, thank you. And now from this space of groundedness and gratitude, I invite you to think of one person who you love very much. 
one person who makes you feel wonderful. And can you imagine them sitting two feet in front of you? Can you even imagine touching their hands, the ecstasy of holding hands with someone, looking right into their eyes? And imagine bravely, vulnerably saying to them, I love you. Noticing what that does to your body, what that does to your heart. And imagine that as you inhale, that they're looking you right in your eyes, this person who you love, this person who makes you feel wonderful, and they are looking right through your eyes into your soul, and they say to you, I love you. And as you inhale, can you open up your heart and allow yourself to receive this love, allow it to permeate from the top of your head down to the bottoms of your feet. And with each inhale, this frequency, this healing frequency of love, this thing that Einstein said is the strongest force on earth is starting to vibrate from the top of your head to the bottoms of your feet. And as you exhale, can you imagine sending love out to everyone who needs it most? For a moment, can we imagine charging up the cells of every single person who's sick right now? Perhaps someone who's feeling alone, someone who can't have their loved ones with them, can we blast them with love? So that perhaps for one moment they feel less isolated, they feel more connected, they feel a little less sad. And as we inhale, we can come back to the eyes of this person who we love, strengthening our own frequency of love. And as we exhale, let's send this out to all of the nurses, all of the doctors, all of the hospital administrators, all of the grocery workers, the delivery people, everyone who is bravely stepping up and keeping things turning, everyone who is bravely stepping up and acting in service. Can we blast them with some much needed love? And know that as you send this love out, it is simultaneously coming back to you. So as you inhale, imagine opening up your heart, inhaling and strengthening this beautiful healing frequency inside of your body. And as you exhale, imagine sending it out to the entire planet Earth. You can imagine it like a light coming out of your heart or perhaps a radio wave or just a wave of water just circumnavigating the globe, sending this beautiful healing frequency all the way around the planet. And imagining again that perhaps one person who was feeling alone or sad feels a little less so, feels a little more connected, a little stronger. Really good. Giving yourself a big internal high five, taking a cleansing inhale, starting to move your hands, your feet. And as you exhale, letting go of anything that is not serving you or who you want to be through this time. One final cleansing inhale. And as you exhale, you can even shake off your hands, shaking off anything that isn't serving you or who you want to be in this time. And in your own time, whenever you're ready, we can start to slowly, gently open the eyes. High five, friends. High five. We did it. <laughs> um, so I know there was a lot of components to that. I, I like to keep talking to you, especially for people who don't have training yet. But the simple things you can pull out from that is the 2x breath to start, even with no meditation training, even if you hate it, just in for two, out for four. It is simple. It is also powerful enough to stop an anxiety attack in its tracks. It's just in for two, out for four. And then the love bomb, you know, you could do this as you fall asleep at night. I think it's so powerful to send love out to people. You could do it to your mom, your dog, your ex. You know, I like I've to send it to that. healthcare workers right now and to people, yeah. especially, the, you know, for me, the thought of people being sick and alone is especially heartbreaking. And so I just like to really blast those folks with as much love as possible. That was and I think to me, you know, I've, I started doing I mean, that after Dr. listening. Kelly, I started doing that when I read uh, Larry Dossie and talking about the power of prayer 
and sending love is a form of prayer that you can send to, to people. I send it to my patients uh, when I meditate, to my family, loved ones, and to the entire universe. I think that's a sentiment for us all to take. And this was a beautiful, beautiful special. I thank the panel very much. Please go through and tell us how we can find more of this love that I, I don't know. I just need to give somebody a big smooch. <laughs> that's what I'm feeling. So Dr. Pedre, starting with you, where can we find you? You can find me online at uh, Dr. Vincent Pedre on Facebook, uh, Dr. Pedre at Instagram, and to check out more about the work that I do, go to happygutlife.com. Beautiful. Thank you for your contribution today on a holiday. Appreciate it. Dr. Rosenberg. Uh, Dr. Rosenberg, uh, Dr. Joe Rosenberg.com is the central location of a lot of my work, and there's TED Talks. I'm also on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and such. So. I can, I can be pretty much found anywhere on the internet. So thank just, type, just type in my name. Thank you, Dr. Rosenberg, for your contribution. You bet. Today. You bet. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. And Emily, thank mm -hmm. you so much. Tell us where we can get a hold of you. Yeah, so the easiest place is just zivameditation.com. It's Z-I-V-A meditation.com. And if you go there, um, we have an online course that we're actually gifting to doctors on the front line. We're giving full scholarships right now. We've given away $775,000 worth of scholarships in three weeks. Fabulous. I think we're going to hit a million by the end of April, which is really exciting. Um, it's also 50% off for everyone else. So for people who are like, I really want to learn the skill, that's there. And then we also have a free self-care center, which has interviews with experts, which I'd love to have all of you guys on. Um, it has guided visualizations. There's a kids center, um, an, an interview with my therapist. So it's a really robust free center and all of that is at zivameditation.com. Beautiful. And thank you so much for your contribution today, Emily. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it, it may, uh, Kellyanne, if, if you don't mind me adding to the resources, um, yeah. there's also uh, a resilience attitude checklist. Yes. Uh, and and uh, which is, uh, would be at my website and then with the forward slash stay up and then people can get download a PDF of my Ease Your Anxiety book. Wonderful. Um, so, so that that can both of those are found on my website. Well, all these experts have so much to offer, as you can clearly see, and they they make a lot available online. So, we are signing off on the special edition of Doctors Night Out. We're signing off with all the grace and all the love, wishing you a beautiful tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.